This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. This week, we're proud to present the first episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics, which is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In our first episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, sits down with infectious disease epidemiologist, Professor James Wood, and mathematician, Professor Julia Gogg, to bring you an overview of infectious disease modeling and to answer some questions about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, welcome, it's um, Rob Doubleday here. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the first time that CSAP has tried to adapt what we do um, to the online environment. So what CSAP has done over the years is to try and create more and better um, spaces for scientists and experts and policymakers and policy advisors to learn from each other, talk to each other, um, and ask questions of each other. Um, I know lots of people have lots of questions about our understanding of the current pandemic, the epidemiology, on what basis um, governments are making current decisions, how, how much confidence can we have in the knowledge that the models are producing, what are the uncertainties, how are they being updated um, as new data comes in, um, as new experiences is uncovered. Today, we'll be exploring some of those questions. Now, I want to introduce very briefly uh, Julia Gogg, who's Professor of Mathematical Biology, um, head of the Disease Dynamic Research Group in Cambridge, and um, also currently working hard as part of the SAGE process, so the Scientific Advisory Group in Emergencies that's contributing to the COBRA decision-making. So we're very grateful, Julia, to you for sparing this hour in what I know is an extremely busy time for you. And James Wood, who's Professor of Epidemiology and Head of the Vet School at Cambridge, and also co-lead of Cambridge University's Infectious Diseases Initiative. So thank you both. So I wonder, just for a kind of initial overview, um, if we could turn to you, Julia, and tell us, you know, what is the current state of epidemiological understanding of COVID-19? How do I summarise where we are in this? Um, I think the thing to understand is there's lots of different types of models running at any given time. There isn't just the one true model with the one version of what's going on. Um, and there's models being used for real predictions. There's several um, teams and models doing that. But there's also models which are thinking about the longer term um, dynamics, what happens after the next few weeks. And there's models running which are just bits of things just trying to say if behavior changes in this way what does it do to the overall transmission rate so if that makes sense there's there's lots of lots of groups of models just not just one and um, the state of what we know about it that's changing every day right and it depends on which thing um you want to answer as to whether we know a lot or a little so when it comes to questions like you know what government the UK government should be doing today or in the next few days, where are the current kind of major uncertainties from the, from the, um, from the models? Well, from the data. So you've got, firstly, information is really lagged. UK is not doing massive amounts of um, general population testing at the moment, as you know, right? So it's quite hard to see what's happening live. Instead, what we're having is a signal of people who are ending up in critical care and, of course, um, deaths from COVID. And that gives a picture which is very much lagged from what's happened in transmission by a week or two. So that's probably the most difficult source of uncertainty. What we're going to see on the news today for the number of deaths tells us about transmission rate um, between one and a half and two and a half weeks ago, right? Um, that's really hard to work with. The number one uncertainty which anyone uh, working on this would give money to know is what proportion of people have actually been infected, right? Um, are we going to get somewhere near where it will turn over for depletion of susceptibles? Can we talk about herd immunity? Is the number of cases just what we see or is the number of cases actually rather more than what we can see immediately right now? That's, that's the number one thing. So just to follow that up, 
how how so that will really just depend on on testing and and, and do we have the tests now and what is stopping us getting that knowledge so testing will I mean, james can talk to this more i mean the testing will get at who's you know if you swab them they've got detectable virus right now um have had we had perfect testing of everyone for last several weeks that would do it but that's not an option uh, another route and um, the route which will change this uh, will be serological testing and that's not testing for who's got virus right now that's taking blood and seeing um who has a signal of immunity that they've had the virus in the past once that starts happening and i think you'll see that soon that will really change uh, our knowledge of what's going on maybe james wants to explain what serological testing is yeah, thank you. Uh, Julia, I think that's a, an excellent synopsis. Um, and I think that your um, summary of where uncertainties come from a lack of data is really important. I think the greater, a, a greater complexities will come also as we uh, start to ramp up testing, because suddenly we're going to find lots more infections. That, that, and that doesn't, that's not going to mean that transmission is suddenly, um, suddenly ramped right up but it will give a, a, a broader um, representation of, of what's going on. The, uh, and that's testing for virus, which is typically being done at the moment in samples from swabs taken from the nose, but increasingly there may be um, blood samples used for that as well um, for people, from people in intensive care wards and so on. I think the, uh, Julie's highlighted it, and I'd just like to emphasize it, um, we do not know at the moment, we know how many people have ended up in hospital, but we do not know um, how many people have actually been infected and perhaps mildly, um, only mildly affected. In particular, that might be very relevant for the young who internationally have had a very, very low rate of disease. Um, for me, it's almost inconceivable um, based on lots of infections in um, lots of other human infections, but also pretty much every other infection in, in any other animal that you might think of. It's almost inconceivable that the young are just not getting the infection. But at the moment, we're lacking the direct evidence of that. Um, this is where serology testing, which is typically done um, by blood testing, that can be by a uh, blood sample drawn into a an, into a tube and sent off for laboratory testing, or it can be, can be done uh, using a finger prick test, such as you might test a blood sugar for a diabetic, and then put onto a, a local so-called lateral flow device. Um, so you put the, your your blood spot onto the onto the device, leave it for a few minutes, and see where the band ends up with it. And that that will demonstrate if you have an, a specific immune response to the virus, which for all of these infections is taken to be evidence of um, a prior infection because you don't have uh, uh, immunity to any infection unless you've met that virus either through infection or through vaccination and until we know just what proportion of the population have been infected actually um, Julie and I were talking about this yesterday in any country it would help we know what the case rates have been in other countries but what we don't know is what their infection rates are and that's critically missing information that, that we need really urgently and, and I think until we've got that, there are going to continue to be models such as the one that was published, I talked about on um, Channel Forward last night, about half of, the, half of the population of the country having been infected. Well, I've read that paper and just think it's wrong. Um, it's just modelling the assumptions. It's what the, what the uh, really good Oxford scientists think are plausible assumptions, but they've, um, I think, uh, I'm not alone in, in, in thinking that the and conclusions and certainly the way they've been represented in the press yeah that that paper it's, it's if you the representation of it in the press is not quite what the paper says but of course that's how every paper is going at the moment some headlines been extracted um that's that that paper is by our colleagues in oxford i think shanetra gupta is the senior author and jose lorenzo is the lead author yeah. um what it's doing is taking the uk i think the death data and then it's fitting actually relatively simple models, but you should start with a relatively simple if you don't want to do anything else or don't need to do anything else. And it's putting in different scenarios of um, slightly varying R noughts. It's putting in, crucially, there's a parameter rho in there, which is the proportion of people who get seriously ill if they're infected. It's putting a whole swathe of different rows in there, 
and basically showing that any of them can fit the data. So rather than it saying 50% of the population have had it, it's saying current data is consistent with 50% or 5% or anything in between. And um, it's been taken by the press as the Oxford group is saying this. I don't think that's quite fair, um, but it's adding another voice saying, look, we can't be sure this is this curve it, with this many people infected exactly is exactly where we are. There's a whole range of things which could be uh, the case, including just about consistent with 50% uh, have been affected. I don't believe that, but nor do I believe it's only 1% that's been affected, right? So it's all consistent. The likely infection rate in London is probably much higher than it is in East Anglia where I live, where they, the, even the, the severe numbers are still rather low. And, it's, uh, and that, that's, that, that kind of complexity of space and time, they don't try to include those things in that sense. Um, and so it's not really a criticism of the paper, but it's uh, people are frantically extrapolating across the whole country from this stuff. And it's just, that's not, um, it's not helpful. Can we, or, or are we, running trials currently of P asymptomatic people around the country so we can have a better idea of what proportion of people are affected by the disease? I'm sure, in fact, I know people are designing these studies. They haven't been done. Um, but if you are going to do it for the UK, as James has pointed out, you, you can't think about the UK as being uniform. Uh, and certainly the picture in London looks different, basically, to the rest of the UK. So you might have one trial in London and another trial in another area or a few areas. But the other thing you could do, and um, potentially you can do this much sooner, because um, these serological tests, and James will understand more, they, they don't sort of test positive like the day after you've had the virus or the week. It can take some weeks for someone um, to have positive serology. So actually what you want to be doing is testing uh, the place which is the furthest ahead and actually say you've got some brilliant serological studies in Italy that would tell us um, we could extrapolate a lot about what's going on in the UK from that so it doesn't even have to be to the UK to tell us about UK and indeed with the timing question we might learn more um, by um, looking at what's happening in another country earlier rather than waiting for UK in a few weeks time. As a lay person looking at this trying to understand the the course that this epidemic seems to be taking in different countries what do we make what's a lay person to make of the fact that it looks to be different in very different countries is that because the data is different or the the actions that governments are taking is different or the structure of the population or social interaction is different do we understand anything about the the variation geographically of what's going on we understand something um but not got lots and lots of questions but the, the key thing, okay, I'm, I'm going to put um, the, the, the Far East aside because that's a slightly different story, but say focusing within Europe, one possibility is we're basically all having the same thing, just we're at different timings. Um, and a timing that's been put out there in the last few days is basically UK is Italy two weeks later. Um, it's, it's slightly more nuanced than that, because as we've already said, you can't think of UK as all being a uniform thing, and you can't think of Italy as all being a uniform thing. But it may be that different regions basically are on the same trajectory by default, except a few weeks lagged, right? Um, that could be slightly nuanced by the control measures that have been put in place have been subtly different uh, relative to this timing. Um, um, we'll start to see that play out. One of the things is these control measures like the lockdown in the UK um, this week, you're not going to see the signal of that until a week and a half, two weeks later. And I think that's something the public will be um, really struggling with in the next few days when the number of cases continue to increase, despite, well, sorry, the number of deaths continue to increase despite um, having lockdown. Thank you. Um, James, just can I ask you a, a question about what epidemiologists can do to help on kind of on the other side of the peak, as it were? So when governments are thinking about both the kind of medium term uh, of how we extricate ourselves from these kind of pretty harsh measures, and then how do we um, sort of continue to be vigilant, you know, in, in the months to come? How 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 What's the overview, the big picture of what we can be expecting over the next sort of three to 12 months? 
But I think the big problem for all of the European uh, policies, and uh, Julia, I'm sure we'll have a, an informed view of this as well, is the exit strategy from them. At what stage do we think we can um, relax physical distancing? The, until we know um, really how widespread the infection has been, not just the, the number of cases of, of ill people, um, I don't think that, that it's going to be very clear um, or it's not going to be very easy to infer how, um, how widespread the infection is and therefore what the, the sort of level of population immunity is. From someone not involved in the SAGE process, it was very unfortunate, um, I think, the way that, that uh, herd immunity is now regarded as a bad thing. Um, herd immunity, which is not an all or nothing thing, it's a relative thing. Um, it's now regarded as a, as a bad policy. It's not a policy at all. It's just something that happens in epidemics. And it's one of the main reasons why epidemics go up and then they come down again. They come down again because you're running out of, of susceptible fuel for the fire um, as more and more of us become immune. And, and until we really know what, whether it's immunity or, social, uh, or physical distancing or the combination of the two that are going to um, drive an epidemic decline or decline in the epidemic curve. Um, it's very difficult to know what the, the, the next policy change should be. This infection is not going to go away anytime fast in my view and I don't think the WHO thinks it is either. I think this is where we will really need more serology data just to demonstrate how, how widespread the infection is. I mean, well, models will give some insight into, into some of the differences between the effects of, of physical distancing and, um, and, and, and infection rates and so on. But really what we're going to need is, is new data. And this is where I'm really encouraged by the scale of ramping up of testing. Um, this great new centre in Milton Keynes and so on that, that um, have become uh, at least announced over the last few days. Um, but, the, the, but there's, a, there's going to be a lot more um, sorts of data we're going to need as we progress through this epidemic and start thinking about um, how we can try and get going again. And, I, and, and one thing I am absolutely clear about is the American presidential approach is um, not one that I'd want to be following. James, could you talk a little bit beyond, you know, what lessons would you hope that countries are going to be learning from this? You know, what do you hope to see? Um, change as a result of our current experience and particularly sort of in terms of the international community you know are there particular things you'd like to see in terms of international cooperation and, and I think that there are um, things uh, that a number of us have been saying about the risks of diseases coming from wildlife and I, I've been working with collaborators uh, along the zoo um, the government's uh, veterinary laboratories and amazing collaborators in many different countries in Africa looking at bat viruses um, and how they might spread to humans. A number of us have been uh, talking, researching and talking about the risks of this sort of thing happening. Um, and some things are very clear uh, international policy responses to epidemics of this scale. And live wildlife markets, um, which are a particular feature of, of parts of the Far East, I think Far East of Asia, are, are things that we should um, be moving to try and actively um, uh, get rid of. I mean, they're just, they, they, they pose such awful disease risks and they're, they're not great for the animals either. Um, I think that needs to be a coordinated international effort. That's, um, there are other things around things like bushmeat in Africa, which actually is not just, a, it's not a kind of a trade cultural issue, it's much more of a livelihoods issue, um, where people do it because um, they need to feed their family in many cases. And, and, and it, so all of these things are complicated and nuanced, but doing what we can to try and um, reduce the risks of this thing happening, this sort of thing happening in the first place, I think are really important. That's on the kind of animal human interface side, the One Health side of, of things. Um, I think there's a whole issue around international co cooperation and collaboration and responses when these sorts of things happen. And, and actually, I, one of the things that, that I have been really impressed by has been the international scientific collaboration that came, um, particularly in the first um, month through late December into January coming from China, where there's very good sharing 
of amazingly good quality data, virological data from this new epidemic where we didn't really know what was going to ha happen with the whole thing. And, and that has come about, I think, through a lot of um, good collaborations between Chinese scientists and UK scientists and um, scientists in Australia and Singapore and so on. And I think that those uh, international collaborations generally, not just with China, but also countries in Africa and so on, are amazingly powerful tools for um, making sure we've got early and rapid information exchange where situations like this occur. And I think that they can be, in many cases, more reliable than formal surveillance programs um, for new things. Um, often surveillance programs, uh, formal surveillance programs are based on very clear case definitions and and one problem with a new disease is often it doesn't fit into, a, into an established case definition. So, so I think that, that there are a number of um, important lessons uh, that we can think about, both in terms of prevention, but also response um, that can come from this epidemic. And I, um, yeah, we should be keeping a note as we go along about the lessons learned um, in all of this stuff. So how are we counting COVID-19 deaths in the UK and how does that differ from other countries? Yes, we're, we're all wondering about this. So Italy does seem to have a higher death rate. This could be to do with um, definition of what is a coronavirus death, whether it's someone who dies and then uh, post-mortem are decided to be positive uh, with coronavirus, which will of course make the death rate from coronavirus look much higher. My understanding in the UK is that all the testing resources are going into uh, critically, uh, critically ill patients, ITUs are being prioritised, which means we will also pick up a higher rate of coronavirus deaths. The one I don't understand and I don't have any insight or knowledge from is the death rate in Germany appears to be very low. Uh, is that because deaths are being coded up slightly differently? Um, and yeah, there's, there might be a big difference between different ways different countries are doing this. Um, in the longer term, there will be ways to look at this because, um, so for influenza, for, for many years, um, we, we've, you know, we, sorry, others have developed methods to look at um, mortality, P&I deaths, uh, pneumonia and influenza deaths. And there's a way to do that, to look at excess over baseline and if you pick that up between different countries, you start to suddenly pick up some consistent pictures when you look at excess. Um, looking at excess for any given um, short term situation, you can't do it. You can't say this death would have happened anyway for other reasons. Um, it's just impossible. But when you've got a longer series, you should be able to take out excess. But you've got to do it in a seasonal way, in an age structure way. Right. So in the longer run, there might be some way, no matter how deaths are coded up, to look at um, excess blips that fit um, the timing of this epidemic to see really what was going on between countries as in um, deaths that wouldn't have happened. What do we know about who we're testing for coronavirus and why we're testing them? I mean, if you understand why these tests are done, you might be able to make slightly more nuanced statistical models of uh, what's going on. But to start with and I think almost everywhere now all you've got is there's this many tests that were done and you don't necessarily know why each test was done um, just correcting that would be a massive improvement. It seems to me that very likely one of the things that's going to be learned is questions about data and and the authentication of data as it relates to individuals and how you know decisions are made based on that and what do we know about immunity? So there are other studies on coronaviruses, not COVID-19, but um, coronaviruses, right, some of them are in circulation anyway. There's two types which are generally, you call them common cold, they're bundled in as part of that. And there's a study that was published uh, on March the 6th from the Harvard group, trying to look at within those common cold types, what's the duration of immunity? And then also, what's the interaction between the types? And then how might this interact with COVID-19? Uh, the story is very uncertain. At the moment, the picture we're working with is to, it's consistent with saying there is some immunity to it. It lasts um, hopefully long enough to turn an epidemic over. Whether it's long lasting or not, 
don't know but if this immunity is of the scale of most of the year or at least the half-life of it is most of the year um, that doesn't really change strategies for now in terms of um, what you're looking at for the coming months what it will change is what happens to this virus in the long term and there's basically um, about three different pictures that could happen long term right um, one is that this is essentially equivalent to an SIR, that immunity is long enough that this thing blasts out, plays out in one go, which might be a few months, a year, a couple of years, uh, and then it's essentially gone or it can be gone. Uh, another possibility is this thing has shorter immunity and high enough transmission that basically it stays with us um, forever. It might become one of the seasonal nasties, I mean, really nasty seasonal nasty. Um, but it will never be as bad as 2020, where we're basically all susceptible. So it'll be like um, a bad flu year every year. Um, another possibility, which um, instinctively feels entirely possible, which is this will be a more sporadic thing. So it won't settle immediately to a nice sort of annual thing where we can understand it. But it may be that we get this thing eventually under control, turned over, and it'll just pop out again in two or three years time. So we'll have another bad time. But again, never as bad as 2020. Just to say we don't know about duration of immunity. There's reason to be concerned with coronaviruses that immunity isn't going to be perfect. The vast majority of people probably get the infection and probably develop an immune response and, and get rid of the infection. That's what's going to drive things over the next few weeks. And the, and the exceptions will be more important things um, to impact stuff in the longer term, but aren't going to change the main pattern of stuff now. So why are some cases mild and others seem quite severe? Is it act impacting different age groups differently? It's still at very early stages, and, uh, and there is a, a key question as to whether or not the young are just not getting infected, which I don't believe, I don't think anyone really believes, but this is where the serological data are so important to demonstrate that young are actually genuinely getting infected and just not getting ill. I think we think that's quite unusual. Um, pandemics are very unusual though. None of us have ever met these infections before. By definition, that's why they're pandemic. I think it's very interesting to, um, we think we understand things like measles very well. And we understand that this is measles internationally is a childhood disease. Um, and, the, and there is a, a significant but low death rate um, from measles. And we all know and recognize that. What's really interesting is if you look back over 100 years to see how measles has invaded communities like in the Faroe Islands, where um, because they're very small island communities, they mostly didn't have measles. So people could live up to the age of 40 or 50 and not have measles. And what you see there, and you also see this in the, some of the indigenous tribes of, of the Amazon and elsewhere, is when measles is introduced, the death rate in those over the age of 30 or 40 is much higher than it is in young. And so, so what we may be seeing here is a not uncommon feature of many diseases that we never normally see because we've all caught the bugs when, when we were um, babies or kids and, and then developed immunity and then um, the patterns then are never the same. And so, so I, I think that, that what we're seeing here with the very old just um, progressively getting it worse may be a natural feature of more infections than, than we actually realise because we never normally see this, this pattern in non-pandemic um, non uh, infections. And I think that there will, as you, uh, as you say or suggest, may be a strong genetic underpinning for this. Um, and indeed, the, the Black Death, when it set, swept across the, the, the world, left a um, genetic signature um, uh, where people with um, one or two resistance genes were selected for because they were much better at surviving to reproduce. And so they became more common compared to those that were more susceptible. And it may well be that, that, that um, part of the... Um, do you get ill or not? It's just a, an accident of your genetic background that, um, or a feature of your, uh, your, your genetic background. And these are things that will become much clearer when we start doing serology. Do either of you have any final thoughts? I think by, by far the most important thing is not worry about the, the data sharing, is get some data in the first place. And this is where working to produce serological data 
in this country because we can control that even if we can't control what comes from China or, or Italy. It's so important. Huge thanks to James and Julia both for taking the time to speak to us now and I think that your um, expertise and research and knowledge is obviously deeply appreciated at this moment. CSAP Science and Policy podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This series, Science, Policy and Pandemics, has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and produced by Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Professor James Wood and Professor Julia Gogg. The sound effects in this episode were ambient hum pitched from the YouTube audio library. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.